Is demonic oppression and possession real? And if so, what are the warning signs? Are those of us who are involved in exploring the paranormal vulnerable to demonic attack? And if so, what can we do to protect ourselves? What kind of things happen during a demonic possession and during an exorcism? Does the person performing the exorcism actually get attacked? Do people who are possessed actually perform supernatural acts such as speaking in tongues and different languages and do they perform other miraculous feats like levitation or possessing superhuman strength? Renowned worldwide exorcist and spiritual deliverance minister, Reverend Bill Bean, joins me to talk about the demonic and also about his take on things like UFOs and the Mandela Effect, as he covers in his new book, Stranger Than Fiction 2. Okay, so uh, joining me tonight is a world-renowned exorcist, uh, spiritual deliverance minister, and he is also known as the spiritual warrior, Reverend Bill Bean. And Bill is also an internationally known author, lecturer, and paranormal and supernatural expert. His latest book is titled Stranger Than Fiction 2, where he delves into multiple paranormal and unexplained topics to include the demonic. At a young age, Bill and his family were tormented by demonic forces, and he now helps others who are dealing with the demonic and has helped hundreds of people in America and uh, across many other countries. Bill's spiritual warfare deliverance ministry deals with anything from curses, blocks, attachments, obsession, oppression, and even de demonic uh, possession. Bill, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. Oh, my pleasure, Corey. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. Uh, we're we're going to get into this topic of the demonic. Uh, it, it is a very disturbing topic for many. Uh, and you have obviously uh, experienced this for, for quite some time. Uh, but before we do that, I know that you dealt with this from starting at a young age. Uh, yeah. home, a ranch home you lived in, you and your family. Take us back to kind of how that all started and how that early part of it played out. Yeah, and I've written eight books. And in the first book, which is called Dark Force, uh, I write about these things. You know, I, I said in that book that the story began when my family and I moved into a three-bedroom ranch-style home located in Glen Burnie, Maryland, in a community called Herondale. But it actually goes much further back than that. And I wasn't aware of that until after I had written the book. And uh, a family member, my mother's brother, uh, filled me in on some additional information that, and it's very difficult uh, when these types of things happen, Curry, people don't like to talk about it. And I have very little family left. Neither of my parents uh, saw the age, lived to see the age of 50, and many other family members died under very tragic and mysterious circumstances. Um, so my uncle, again, who is uh, still with us, he was telling me that uh, they had my mother and, and he, and uh, they had a sister, which uh, she's no longer with us, uh, they uh, all had many paranormal supernatural experiences in childhood and they moved around quite a bit as children and one of the places that they moved to was in that very area of the community known as Herondale not far from that house so I found that to be fascinating I wish you would have told me sooner before I had written the book but again people come to things in their own time and I appreciated him sharing it with me but uh, Boy, oh boy, I, you know, when you, you look back and, and when I got that information, I said, wow, this goes way much further back than I thought. And then he also told me that two family members many, many, many years ago, as far back as maybe 100 years ago, had actually conjured up demonic forces. And through that invocation and invitation, um, those demonic forces did come in, come on the family, created a variety of damage uh, on on the uh, my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family. And so I feel, in looking back on this, it is entirely possible that the demonic forces that were conjured up by those family members actually led my parents to that place where evil was already present and manifest in the home and in the area. And that's why it was so severe for my family and I, because it was like walking into this perfect storm. So there was already evil attached to the family. And then leading us into a place where evil is already present and manifest and having that all come together um, 
it really was a hellish existence. I wouldn't wish my childhood on anybody. I mean, it was awful. It was terrible. And uh, it was full of being in the fear-based, trauma-based way of thinking and living. Um, my mother was the first to have an experience, and it took place shortly after moving in. And she was unpacking uh, boxes and organizing. My dad uh, had taken us with him for the day. And again, I have an older sister, younger brother. He had taken us with him for the day to uh, my grandparents, his parents' house, to uh, give my mother what he thought would be peace and a break from us being under her feet and distracting her. Uh, so she could take her time and unpack and organize uh, the home. And while she was doing this, she felt a presence come into the room. She thought, uh, her initial thoughts were that it was my dad sneaking back into the house to play a joke on her. And she spun around fully anticipating on seeing him and to her shock, no one was there. And so... As you can imagine, she was taken aback, she was startled, she was perplexed, she was unnerved, all these things. And then suddenly one of the bedroom doors, my sister's bedroom door, slammed shut by itself. And that was enough to make her go outside and wait until we returned. So that's where it began. And the um, activity gradually increased uh with more of these types of noises and events and uh, different types of phenomena uh and then increased uh into violent physical attacks on us by these demonic entities that greatly contributed to the destruction of my family so um that's where it all began the house was located at the bottom of a downhill cul-de-sac and um it had a very long and deep ravine behind it that stretched for probably two or three miles. And um, you would come in through the, no, let me say this first, the house was semi-dilapidated. My father, uh, William Bean Sr., who was a master carpenter, saw it as a restoration project. And he did. He absolutely restored it and made it look great. Um, but from the very beginning, Curry, uh, I was four, my sister was uh, 13, and we both recall standing there and just being unnerved. The house just had this very foreboding and ominous look and feel about it, and equally so on the inside. So you would enter in through the front door, and the first thing that you would see uh, was like this uh, coat closet. It had these two wooden sliding doors. So you would open the door, and that's pretty much in front of you. For, and then you go into the living room. And the house was always very dark. It had this dark brown paneling on the walls, and it was always black in color. So it was always very dark in the house. And, and you know yourself. You could uh, sense, uh, we, we could sense the presence of evil. Uh, we know when, when God has angels and something divine around us, we can feel that love and peaceful feeling and goodness. But it's the reverse. When the enemy has his demons there, um, there's an atmospheric change of pressure. Sometimes a person's ears will ring. Um, sometimes you will just feel this heaviness in the air and um, accompanied by horrible odors and whether that is the smell of uh feces or like something going bad uh or sulfur whatever that may be i mean when you smell those types of things demons are present and so yeah, you, you took the words out of my mouth there that was going to be my next question is there is there strange odors present and that's yeah what? absolutely my brother and so uh you know as you're in the living room you would make a right down this long hallway and the uh, hallway had this uh, tile floor, hard tile. And my brother and I shared the first room on the right. My parents' room was the second on the right. And my sister's room was across the hallway, the last room on the left. And I believe that's the room uh, where the main portal was. And I think the main portal was in her closet and it was adjacent to a linen closet at the end of the hallway. 
And the reason that I say that I think it's the main portal or it was the main portal is because oftentimes we would see entities or balls of light or whatever go right through that linen closet. And if, if you went deep enough in there, then it's going, going to uh, connect in with her closet in her bedroom. Furthermore, uh, right outside of her window, my dad first had erected a pool there when we first moved in. And again, my father was a master carpenter. He did everything to perfection and wouldn't settle for anything less than. So when he put this pool up, you better believe that it was sturdy and it was strong and everything was okay, or he would have done whatever to make sure that it was. So they put the hose in, they fill it up overnight. The next morning, my parents get up and the yard is flooded and something gave that pool in and um, just with tremendous force. I wrote in the book that it would have taken a team of strong men, you know, to be able to uh, cave that pool in the way that it was, you know, the rail cap was bent. Uh, it was just absolutely caved in. So that was the first incident uh right outside of my sister's window in that area my dad had moved the pool after that into the backyard i'd say probably 20 30 feet away from that spot into the backyard and it stood without incident for all those years after that however my dad ended up building a garage right in that same general space and he put uh, a basketball uh, backboard and rim up for me there. And I would spend, I was an athlete as a child. That was my escape from all of this Curry sports. And um, I would spend Can't hours. Stand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would spend hours out there. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I could be out there for like three hours and everything's fine. Then all of a sudden, I feel like something is there with me. I drop the ball and I run to the house and this thing is literally chasing me as I'm running into the house. Now I never saw it, but I knew it was there and it was absolutely chasing me. So again, this is all in that very same spot, which leads me to believe that the main portal in the house was coming out of my sister's room in that closet adjacent with the linen closet. So, um, I know you have questions. I just wanted to give you and your audience um, just try and paint a picture as best as I could to give a proper description of this. Now, Bill, did you actually did you actually see these entities at times? Uh, family members or you? Absolutely. Uh, so as this progressed, my sister was the first to have an actual experience and, and I wouldn't call it an attack, although it probably would have turned into a, an attack uh, had she not been able to scream. This was in um, 1970, uh, the end of 70. She um, was asleep in her bed and then something woke her. She felt a presence in the room. She couldn't see anything, but she knew something was there. And she was going to get up and get my parents as something grabbed her leg. And, and thank God she was able to let out a scream that woke my parents. They came running into the room. They found her traumatized. And they also found red marks on her leg where she said something had grabbed her. So I was the next one to have a physical encounter. And, and that was a, a, a demonic attack. And it took place in 1971, not long after her experience. And... Um, my brother and I shared the room, again, the first room on the right. His bed was closest to the window. Mine was closest to the hallway. And so something woke me up uh, from my sleep one night. Same thing like my sister. I couldn't see anyone or anything there, but I knew something was there. I go to get out of bed. So I'm getting out of bed on the left side. I'm getting out. I'm going to get my parents. And a tremendous force grabbed me by my shoulders, threw me back onto the bed, pinned me on my back. And Curry, I've given well over 2,000 interviews in my career. And every time I talk about this, I can't put into words the level of fear and trauma that I was feeling at that moment. 
I felt like I was going to die. I felt like my heart was literally going to jump out of my body. I tried to scream out for my parents. My mouth wouldn't work. Um, I was paralyzed. The only thing that seemed to move or work were my eyes. And many horrible things happened to me during the course of that. It seemed like it was hours. I'm sure it was only minutes. And um, it all ended with the appearance of this uh, divine manifestation, which I have to believe was an angel. This, uh, I could look down at the foot of my bed and see this mist, that I guess ectoplasm that was forming, white. And out of it, this figure emerges, this divine figure. And as she materialized, uh, all of the horrible things that were happening to me suddenly stopped. And she looked at me and smiled and gazed at me, and I felt so much love and comfort and protection from this being. And then she just turned to her left and floated right up through the ceiling. And then I raced out of bed and went and woke my parents up. And the most amazing thing about this, Curry, is that the divine manifestation I have to believe that it was an angel, but the angel took the form of my mother, looked exactly like my mother, and I was not the only one to see her or have an encounter with her. Other family members did as well, including my own mother, when this divine manifestation came and uh, saved my mother, who was being viciously attacked by a demon, and this manifestation came and literally pulled this thing away from her and it happened more than one time so can you imagine um you were a being attacked like this by some type of sinister entity b uh what we think i can't say otherwise you know it absolutely has to be a divine manifestation um appears and and this angel looks exactly like you so can you imagine i mean just the the whole thing uh, and then it culminates with, you know, this entity coming to save you that looks exactly like you. Wow. Yeah, that's it's incredible. Um, now, did you see this entity manifest again? Uh, what you sounds like you only describe as maybe, maybe an angelic being. Yeah. Did you see it manifest again later after that? Many times over the years because we lived in the house. And it wasn't until I sat down and wrote Dark Force, and I've uh, written a second version as well with uh, additional content called Dark Force Revisited. And um, it wasn't until I sat down and really started to write and and I had to relive, I had to place myself back in all of that again and and relive it. It was very, very difficult for me to write that book um, because of the level of trauma. And... um, Looking back on it, we lived in the house from 1970 to 1980. I don't know how we did it. And when I started really reliving some things, I thought to myself, dear God, how did we endure that for so long? But what happens is, after a period of time, the mind starts to get conditioned to acceptance. So we expected those things to happen. We were conditioned to expect these things to take place. Furthermore, each and every one of us came under a form of demonic oppression at various times to where these things could really get into us and cause us to do things that were way out of character. And I'll start with my father on that one. Uh, My dad was a great man, was so gifted, Curry. He, He was gifted with abilities that uh, most people, you know, the average person would not have those gifts. It was incredible. And his story alone is just so sad and tragic. And uh, so he was a great man who made terrible decisions. And uh, I didn't know this either until a couple of years ago. My brother shared this with me. My dad, uh, William Bean Sr., who was a very powerful individual man's man you know he was used to being in control of every situation and uh, my parents believed in god but 
we never attended church as children. We didn't have any type of faith-based structure. Didn't I'd never read the Bible in my life, uh, you know, at that point. And um, he would not talk about it. Mm. Didn't want to talk about it with us, but did confide in my mother's mother, Dora Harvey, my grandmother, um, that he was seeing apparitions and manifestations in the house. And then my brother revealed to me something that I didn't know. Um, this happened, according to my brother, and he has no reason to lie about it. Um, this happened, I believe, in 1975, before my father left us. He came home in a drunken stupor one night. My brother was on the couch. I was not home. I was at my grandmother's house. And my brother told me that when he came in, he opens the front door, he comes in, and an unseen force grabs him and threw him right through those two wooden doors in that coat closet there. Now, again, my brother doesn't like to talk about this. He's still very traumatized. But he told me that. He's got no reason to lie, and I couldn't believe it. All those years, I never knew that. So my father very much was under attack, uh, mentally, spiritually, and physically, from these demonic forces. My parents were uh, married in 56. My sister was born in 57. There was another child born in 63 that died under very mysterious circumstances. I never could get to the bottom of it. I just, what I do know is that representatives from Johns Hopkins Hospital came and retrieved the body for studies, whatever that means. Now, I was born in 1966 and my brother was born in 69. Um, they were social drinkers. Back then, you had the family house parties and everybody drank and everybody smoked. And so that's how it was back then. However, after moving into the house, his drinking began to increase. And also my mother uh, started developing severe health problems and she had terrible health problems right after moving into the house. She suffered from high blood pressure, which led to a series of strokes, which ultimately led to kidney failure. And um, so my mother suffered more than, more than any other person I've ever seen in my life. And uh, so my dad starts, they go from social drinkers to now he is uh, starting to drink more heavily. Now, he was a contractor, had his own contracting business. And um, suddenly he starts spending a lot of time in the bars, coming home very, very late at night. Uh, he and my mother now are starting to argue because she wants to know why he's not coming home and, you know, why he's out in these bars. Um, and then eventually he starts beating her. Uh, he starts delivering these vicious, vicious beatings to her on a regular basis between 1973 and 1975. Horrific stuff, Curry. And I can recall being eight years old, having to run out and run to a neighbor's house to get the police call on my own father because he was killing my mother. Now, looking back on this, I do know now that all life operates on frequency and vibration. So if our frequency and vibration is on high, life is good, life is positive, we're moving forward. But if we're on low, life is a challenge to say the least. And I feel that when a person is under the influence of alcohol and or a drug, it pulls the frequency and vibration down and leaves the person vulnerable and wide open for demonic attack. So I absolutely believe, due to my father's choices, the devil didn't make him do it. He made those choices to drink. Uh, but while under the influence of alcohol, I believe that these demonic forces were able to enter him and fuel his hatred towards my mother. It's a miracle that he didn't kill her. And uh, he ended up leaving us in 1975. And here my mother thought, she had to have thought, that she would be free from abuse, you know, at his hands. And she was from his hands, but then started being regularly physically abused by the entities. And it had gotten to the point to where she couldn't sleep in her bed anymore and she had to sleep in with us. I mean, it was just hellish. And so uh, we had a, uh, 
priest involved for the last 16 months that we lived there. We are not Catholic, but my step-grandfather was Catholic, and he went to his church, and they sent out a priest, and I certainly appreciate it. And um, Monsignor Auer was involved, uh, again, for the last 16 months that we lived there. It had gotten so severe that uh, both he and my step-grandfather were bringing jars, mason jars, full of holy water, and he would instruct my mother to throw the holy water at the entities, you know, when she would see them. And uh, unfortunately, through no fault of his, um, the activity grew even worse, you know, more violent and more intense. And um, I truly believe in looking back on it, due to the level of attack that we were sustaining, especially my mother, in mind, body, and spirit, I really believe that it contributed to her death. Uh, just a horrible, horrible uh, way of life. The most frequently asked question is, why did you stay? Well, we had no choice because my dad had left us. My mother was very ill. She couldn't work. We had to go on welfare. I mean, that's how horrible it was. She couldn't work. She was in bad health. We ended up losing the house. The house was auctioned off in the front yard. And the man that bought the house in the public auction was aware of my mother's situation. And he let us stay there on a pay-as-you-can-when-you-can basis. And so that's how it all took place. My uh, grandmother wanted us to move with her, but she and my step-grandfather had a one-bedroom apartment. My mother was not going to be a burden to them. And then my mother's sister, um, she lived nearby. Uh, and wanted us to come stay with her, but she had a husband and eight, and eight children. So again, my mother was not going to be a burden to anyone. And furthermore, as I stated a few minutes ago, each and every one of us came under some type of form of oppression. And I believe that hers was that she was sort of bound to the house and to the uh, to the situation. Yeah, interesting. And I was going to ask the question, that was my next question was going to be, was there any outside help that came in? And you kind of answered that already. Yeah. Uh, what, because I know you, I've, I've heard you in a few other interviews, uh, you kind of went on after you, you know, grew up and went on with life. What kind of led you into doing the work you do now, getting involved in exorcisms and and helping people assisting people who have uh, been tormented by this wasn't by my choice that's for sure um it was a calling from god it truly was because i had no intentions of ever doing anything like this uh, once i was finally free i didn't want anymore i wanted just wanted to have peace but uh, i'll tell you God has saved me so many times. And, and after moving out of the house, it wasn't long after, that two tragedies occurred. My beloved grandmother, Dora Harvey, died from a sudden series of heart attacks at the age of 64. And then two months later, my beloved mother, Patricia Bean, died from a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 44. These were the two closest people to me in my life. They were suddenly gone. And I quit school in the eighth grade, lied about my age, went to work for a construction company, and boy, Curry. I was a skinny kid, now thrown into a world with some tough men. That made me a tough man, but I'll tell you what, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I grew up on the streets, I drank, I did drugs, I was violent, um, you name it. I could have very easily have ended up in prison or dead. Most of the people that I hung with back then are dead or in prison, so I could have been there as well. Um, so it was so just difficult because I really didn't want to live. after. After they had uh, passed, I, I really didn't have any desire to live at all. I lived my life on the edge for many, many years. I was a bar bouncer for 20-some years. I could write a book just about those experiences alone. Been in many <laughs> life-threatening situations. Uh, and God saved me every time. And it wasn't until I had an epiphany one day that I, I thought, because I really wanted to tell my story for many, many years, but I, I felt intellectually inadequate. I felt that there was no way that I could present my story in the proper way because of my lack of education. And so one day I had an epiphany that I could do better and be better and strive to do better and be better, but that had to start by making God first in my life. 
And I will never forget asking God to take the urges for alcohol and drugs away from me. I didn't want it anymore in my life. And I was sincere. And I prayed and asked God to take it, and he did. It was a miracle. I never, ever had another urge for a drink or a drug, and that's been 30-some years. Uh, I see it as my mortal enemy now. But back then, I didn't care because I was living very recklessly because I didn't have any desire to live anyway. Um, so that's where it all began for me, Curry, is that I made a conscious choice and decision to make God first in my life. And really, uh, it was difficult because... We can talk all day long about, oh, yeah, I pray I make God first. You have to really have a lifestyle change and a mindset change. So for most of my life, you know, up until that point of really finding God, I lived in the fear-based, trauma-based way of thinking and living. I expected things to go bad and negatively for me, and they did because I invoked it by expecting it. So in the beginning of being sincere in making my commitment to God, it was two steps forward and three steps backward because it is very difficult to change those habits and patterns that we get into. But sure. once I did, what a difference. That's where real transformation started to take place in my life. And then my wife and I were baptized together and it was the turning point for my life in that I knew I was free from all the evil and then not long after that, God put this calling on me. And I resisted it for a long time because I thought, God, you must have a sense of humor. How, how could someone like me be of any help to anyone to do this? And I thought, no way. You know, I'm just now free from this. There's no way I'm going back, you know, and, and confronting evil again. And But that's what God's plan for me was and it took me a while to finally understand that I could do this and that God could work through me to help people so in the beginning I started out giving interviews in um, I want to say 1996 and by 2005 a haunting uh, the Discovery Channel series now it's uh, I think they're coming back again on Discovery Plus um, they got in contact with me. They had heard about my story. They wanted to feature my story on their series. I agreed to do it. That's what put me on the map. And so that show was seen worldwide. And I started getting these messages from people. And some of these people were asking for spiritual help. And I thought, I can't. What can I do? I, I can't help these people. I try and refer them to people that I knew. But that's where it really started. And then when God put that calling on me to do it. And then when I really finally realized that this, hey, this this could really happen. I mean, I God could really work through me to be a help to these people. Then I started studying and I, I spent three, four years in serious biblical studies, ancient history, um, ancient religion, you, you name it, uh, I studied it. And with those studies, Curry, it broadened my intellect. And, I, and, and the more I knowledge that I was gaining, the more confidence I was gaining as well, that, hey, you know, I, I, God's really blessing me and helping me uh, with wisdom and knowledge. And therefore, I have this confidence now that maybe I really can, that he can work through me to help these people. And I'll never forget the first time. And, and then I uh, became an ordained non-denomination minister. And, and after that, I, I went to a family in Maryland, first time. And I believe that it was like 2013, somewhere in there. And I will never forget it. You know, when I, and they had a very strong demonic presence in their home and, and they were, uh, the, the wife uh, was under serious demonic oppression. And I'll never forget when I walked in there, yes, I felt the presence and I ended up seeing uh, evil manifestations as well. But I knew right then and there, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is my purpose in life. And God has really called me to do this. And I never look back from there. So I have been in situations 
that people, even if they were standing beside me, would some would rub their eyes and say, did I just really see that? I have been in places that would make uh, some of the worst horror movies uh, tame in comparison. I can't even describe to you and to your listeners and viewers uh, some of the horrific situations that I have been in and some of the things that I have dealt with. My life has been in danger many times uh, as this spiritual warrior, you know, going to help people. It's just absolutely uh, been an amazing journey, but I wouldn't trade my life with anybody's life on this planet. I can never thank God and praise God enough for saving me for transforming my life and for working through me to help others. It's just a tremendous honor. And it is um, the feeling of joy that I get after helping someone and knowing that God has really worked through me to help them. I can't even describe it. It's off the charts. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, you probably get a lot of uh, context a lot of people contacting you as a result of your story getting out there. Uh, if you look at the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, kind of their threshold for deciding whether to perform these types of ceremonies, if you will, uh, it seems to be a pretty high threshold. Uh, you know, they're looking at mental illness. They're looking yeah. at so many other types of things before they ever decide to take on how has that kind of happened for you? How do you, how have you kind of filtered out some of that? And what are you looking for as you decide this is truly a case I need to, to seriously consider? Well, look, I mean, in all things, you're going to have those that uh, some may be seeking attention um, because they want to get on TV. Some may have mental illness, and I'll say this, uh, mental illness really bleeds in with the spiritual as well. So, yes, there are people who suffer from uh, schizophrenia and all these different types of mental illnesses, but there is a demonic aspect that ties into it. So even people like that, I always pray that God will work through me to be a help to them. I can't guarantee anything to anybody because it's not me. It's the power of God working through me. Um I'm nothing special, but God has done extraordinary things through me in helping others, and I praise him for that. So in this, when people contact me, and I get contacted every single day, Curry, I've helped people not only in America, but in uh, nearly 50 other countries as well. And uh, again, I praise God for it. So I constantly, every day, I'm contacted by people. Since COVID, I'm mostly doing uh, phone and Skype and Zoom sessions. Um, but I, this past Thursday, I did actually go and help a family in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. So what I'm looking for, and my assistant, uh, Melinda, helps me with this. Uh, we, we get the information from the person. You know, I, it's not that I want to know people's deepest and darkest things. I have to know it because, A, I have to, uh, there will be some things in there that will ring true to me that I am looking for. Uh, and secondly, this is part of a purging process. You know, you have to get this stuff up and out and off to break all those legal rights that the devil has in order to be free. So, you know, we, we get the, uh, the background info. And in a lot of the cases, not all, but in a good, uh, a good number, the uh, problem starts in childhood. And usually that is through some type of child molestation, some type of high level of trauma that has been established. So if such an event has taken place, well, we know that the perpetrator obviously uh, is being led by the devil and demons uh, to commit the wicked and heinous act. Unfortunately, when that act takes place and this high level of trauma is reached, then the uh, victim, through no fault of their own, that's for sure, uh, blood and secretions will come out of the pineal gland and the adrenal glands if such a high level of trauma is uh, attained. And these demons will go on to the victim and they'll stay on the victim because they will eat that stuff up like candy and they'll stay attached to the victim until someone like me comes along, an agent for God. 
that God will work through to get rid of this stuff. So not in every case, but in a lot of the cases, that's where it starts. Uh, some of the other cases could be through invocation, invitation, whether that's Ouija boards or uh, calling on entities or whatever. You've opened the door wide for these things to come in. The devil, he deals in legalities and he can go to God and say, I can be in this person's life because they did this or said that or they invited him in or it's, it's a variety of things. And um, so that's why it's so important for me to get the information, to get the backstory. And then I have to uh, rely on God to give me holy discernment, to help me to know what is true and what is not. Um, again, Curry, I don't claim to be anything special, but God gives me a knowing of things. So if I'm reading something or if I'm just looking at somebody, God is already showing me something. I already know things about that person that God is showing me. And even reading their information, I know more things. And I also know if someone is being dishonest and fabricating or trying to, again, just get 15 minutes. Whatever the case may be, I totally rely on God to give me that holy discernment in guiding me accordingly on how I will approach this and how I'll go about helping someone. Yeah, so you you touch on something here that I kind of want to to uh, delve into a little bit more. I, I told you I get involved with paranormal investigating. Now, uh, I see some danger here in what you're talking about in conjuring and that sort of thing. Yeah. Typically, uh, and I would ask you this: uh, people who do what I do, uh, which lately haven't done a lot of it with COVID, of yeah. course. Uh, you know, it's typically not something we're trying to conjure. Uh, not typically, never something we're trying to conjure that's not already there. It's typically we are trying to gather any sort of evidence or investigate what may already be there or what sure. may not. Sure. Uh, so I'm wondering if you see a distinction there. So that would be my first question. Uh, do you see a st distinction between if you're going into a location to, you know, people have reported activity going on? We are simply, in, from my perspective, trying to gather perhaps evidence, whether it's audio evidence, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, so my first question is, do you see a distinction between that versus, say, somebody with a Ouija board, uh, you know, calling on entities or, you know, what have you? Do you just see a s distinction there and do you see a danger in doing what I do and people like me do? Well, there is a distinction because uh, you're going there with the intent to um, gather data and to uh, prove or disprove if uh, something supernatural is in fact taking place. So sure. uh, I cannot condemn you for that. Uh, the person that is uh, conjuring and whether that is through Ouija board or some type of invocation invitation, might as well be swimming in the in the water with the sharks. I mean, what, <laughs> what do you think's going to happen? And I sure. can't tell you how many people have come to me over the years, some people on TV that have come to me for help because they have placed themselves in situations like that and their lives were a shambles. Some people are ready to commit suicide. And uh, this is what the devil does. So. What you're doing also is dangerous. Uh, I won't lie to you, it is dangerous. You have to be very, very careful. I pray for you and your team that you are praying and covering yourselves with the power of God and invoking the power of God over you before you go into these types of things. And I hope that you pray after you leave. Uh, may you never ever have a problem as long as you live. I pray that for your team as well. But uh, you have to be mindful that this is spiritual warfare and even going in to try and quantify something and document uh, does have uh, a dangerous aspect to it. Yeah, I know you covered the topic of ghosts uh, in your book. What's what's kind of your take on ghosts? And yeah, and, and you know, I'd probably get, I may get condemned by some for saying what I'm about to say, but all I could say is it's biblical that, you know, Jesus himself mentioned about uh, seeing a ghost and said to Peter, look, it's me. It's not a ghost. It's me. Uh, so he mentions a ghost there in the Bible. 
Um, so in my opinion, um, perhaps, and look, I don't pretend to know all the answers. No man does when it comes to this. Uh, but perhaps there are, there's a soul which departs us when we die. And perhaps there is another form of a soul that is left behind, which is a life essence. And if that is true, then perhaps this life essence stays behind for whatever reasons. And then has the ability or capability to either repeat certain things, or I guess you'd call that residual, um, or have this intelligent control to be able to do certain things or uh, manifest to certain people. Um, now, here's where it gets blurry. I absolutely believe what I just said to be true, but we also have to be careful that the devil will have these demons called familiar spirits, that they can impersonate our loved ones, our long lost loved ones, uh, mimic the voices, um, and trick people. So we have, this is where discernment comes in because the devil has that ability to send his demons to do those kinds of things. So we yeah. really got to be on guard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I, you touched on the energy aspect of this and I, I think that's important too. Uh, I've noticed some people, when I go into a location, I'm trying to be objective uh, and I'm not, trying to go in from having yeah, kind of that fear aspect. Uh, sure. I've went into locations with people who have been fearful. They walked into a location with fear and lo and behold, they have some sort of scary experience or, sure. uh, you know, I try to, you know, when we went into locations, I try to be as objective as possible and, uh, you know, I, I don't go into a location saying, okay, this is not haunted or it is haunted. Let's just go in and see what we can find out. Let the evidence lead us where it may, if there is any evidence gathered. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, and I've talked to a lot of people who are involved in this field that have never, ever had any sort of demonic type at that threshold that where, where they would say, or they say, yeah, I've had it, but it happened once out of, you know, or maybe a couple of times, you know, people that have done it for 10 or 20 years, they've said, yeah, I have experienced it, but it's very, very rare. And, uh, you know, it happened, but it never happened again, sort of thing. So I, I guess, I guess what I, I'm going, where I'm going with this is, do you think a lot of people, and I've experienced this, uh, that people sometimes tend to, they may even tend to jump to that conclusion prematurely. Uh, we went into locations where we seem like that's almost been the case. But but again, we cannot put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and say for sure what they're experiencing. Well, you hit a key word there, and that is fear. So when a person gets into that mindset of fear, now the frequency and vibration has lowered and they're wide open. So guess what? Something is going to happen because they're in fear. So a person like yourself and others and I've seen this with film crews on the many TV shows that I've done, they are there to document. They are there for production. They are there doing a job. Uh, they are not in fear. They are focused on what they are doing. And for the most part, those people don't have any experiences. And it's because they are not falling into fear. They are there doing a job. And so, that's a major difference. If we can walk into whatever situation it is and, and not have fear, then it's not going to be an adverse negative event for us. But if the person does walk in and, and you know their mind is just absolutely in the fear-based, trauma-based, bad things are going to happen. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, with those kind of people, it's almost like, hey... <laughs> maybe you should reconsider doing this if you're coming in with that mindset. They really should, Curry. And, and in my uh, line of work, I have seen things, again, that 99% of 
of the populace have never experienced and even if they did they would rub their eyes and say did i just see that did that just really happen through it all and i've seen levitation i've seen people's eyes change uh go all white all black red one case uh the lady's eyes went um, like a yellow green color with reptilian slits in the eyes i've seen it all uh, i've experienced physical attack from these things, superhuman strength, um, different voices coming out of the person, um, you name it. So I know it's real, I've experienced it, and of course through my own personal experiences as well. However, as a deliverance minister, exorcist, spiritual warrior, whatever you want to call me, um, I have to be in control of the situation at all times. Therefore, I have to be in faith, strength, and courage. I don't have any fear. And by not having the fear, God is with me and galvanizes me and helps me to stay in control of the situation. There have been instances um, where some have gone into situations like that. And I've heard stories, uh, you know, about pastors or priests or whatever that, that, went into situations like that and then they were physically attacked and they ran out of the house. It's over. You know, once the agent for God is in fear, he's lost control of the whole situation and everything goes south from there. So um, it is my job as a man of God, an agent for God, to be in control of the situation at all times. And that is easier said than done. However, through my strong faith, I do not have any fear and will not allow any fear to come in. And I praise now, God for that. Now, Bill, have you been during when you're performing these exorcisms, have you been physically attacked? Never. Well, yes, physically, not spiritually. So physically attacked from the victim. I've been in situations like that to where uh, one comes to mind that took place in 2017. The I have a usual way of doing things. When I arrive at a residence or business, and even some churches have brought me in to help their pastors and priests, you'd be surprised. Uh, but anyway, usually I say land blessing prayers and things of that nature before I go in. I ask God to send his giant warrior angels to come and take into custody any demons that might be present in or around the land, the um, the, the property, the home, uh, family, pets, anyone connected to the people. Uh, on, on this occasion, uh, I'm, I get out of the vehicle. I'm approaching the front door. The husband of the house opens the door. I'd say probably 20 feet behind him, the wife, who is fully possessed, is standing behind him, and she's hissing at me. And so now the land blessing and all that's out the window. I'm advancing towards her. I'm walking in, uh, I have my briefcase in my hand. And as I'm walking in, she's backing up and all these voices are coming out of her, calling me every foul, filthy name you can imagine and saying, she's ours, you can't have her, God can't have her, she's ours. And, and so I'm continuing to advance and she's backing up. And I finally backed her into a corner in the dining room and she had a, a glass, it's like a chalice looking thing in her left hand. And um, when I backed her into the corner, she charged out and swung that thing at me and I blocked it. Uh, she was trying to bite me, she was spitting on me. I mean, it was, and it, it was a physical, um, the husband was terrified. She'd already attacked him. He was a military man, real good man. He, he never seen anything like that in his life. He was terrified. And uh, so I had to take her down. And here I am now. And this woman, I was probably 300 pounds. Uh, I had to take her down to the floor. She had superhuman strength. And it was by the power of God working through me that I was able to subdue her and keep in control of the situation. Now, here I am trying to physically restrain this person. And at the same time, trying to bind and rebuke and cast these demons out and off and away from her. And this went on uh, for at least 20 minutes on the floor. And then a peace came over her. 
And I knew that it wasn't over with. I think that it just, by the sheer length of time that was taking place at that at that time, these things were worn down. And so I knew it wasn't over. God was showing me that it wasn't over. But my plan at this point was to get her on her feet, get her into uh, a shower and start a form of a baptism uh, through this shower. I was going to bless the water, get her in. So her husband and I and uh, their their uh, their pastor was present as well. We, we get her in to the uh, bathroom, into the shower area, and then it starts up all over again. Now it's another physical struggle and I'm having to restrain her and still trying to bite me again. And uh, I'm binding and rebuking and casting these demons out. And as I'm doing it, I kid you not, Curry, it must have been 20 of them. So as fast as I'm casting one out, another voice materializes, another persona. I'm binding and rebuking and casting that out and on and on and on. So after that takes place, I get her from the shower. Now I want to get her over to this large uh, soaking tub to perform the baptism. I know that if I can get her there and do this final piece of the puzzle here by getting her baptized, that this is going to leave her. It became a physical struggle again. Finally get her in there. Same thing, you know, and, and more demons. I'm binding and rebuking, casting out more voices are materializing and just awful words that are being said. And then we get to the part uh, right before the baptism where I'm saying her name. I said, look, I know you're in there and I know you want to be free from this. God is doing his part. I'm doing my part as an agent for God. Now I want you to do your part. I want you to fight. And so the more I said this, the more I could feel these demons, their grip loosing, uh, loosening on this woman. And then finally, uh, after binding and rebuking and casting the last one out, I did the baptism. Uh, just put her under for a second. You know, I now declare you to be blessed, sealed, sanctified, purified, cleansed, made holy, and baptized by the mighty power of Yahweh in his mighty and holy name in Jesus' name and his Holy Spirit is so. And so then she pops back up and it's like, imagine this. When, when a person is demonically possessed, just imagine somebody grabbing you by your collar and you they got you against the wall and you're on your tiptoes against the wall. Um, that's what it's like. And when they let go, the person slumps and then you start to cry. And that's exactly what happened. And the transformation, I, I was just so elated and overjoyed that this poor woman, I can't even tell you, um, her sufferings. I mean, just off the charts, unimaginable things happened to this woman in childhood. And so... Um, that's where the origins of this were. However, when one of the abusers had died, they brought items into their home, pictures, necklaces, different artifacts. And I'm firmly convinced that when those things came into the home, then this activated. And that's where it all started with this full possession and then her attacking her husband and others. And I was so overjoyed and elated that she was free from it. I was absolutely exhausted as well. But um, what an incredible, miraculous thing that took place that night. And I praise God for it. Without God, there's no way that could have happened. But it would, uh, it would be something, Curry, that you would have had to have been there to see with your own eyes to truly understand what I'm saying to you. Now, Bill, when I think of these, uh, I cannot help but think of the movie The Exorcist. Um, disturbing movie, I still to this day. Yeah. You know, I'm not a horribly religious person, but I cannot watch that movie. It's, it's deeply disturbing to me. Uh, the things that go on in there, I mean, uh, the levitation and uh, now have you heard people speak in languages they don't know, like Latin? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that lady was one of them. Wow. I have seen levitation. I have heard those languages. Um, 
male voices speaking out of females. Uh, one lady, the lady that I told you about her eyes, uh, turning like reptilian slits. She was under uh, voodoo curses. And um, when I was performing the exorcism over her, her body started twisting and contorting in ways that a human body cannot. How bones were not breaking is beyond me because the way that woman's body was twisting and contorting, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> my hats off to you. That's uh, that has uh, got to be scary stuff to be experiencing. Then another young man, uh, when I was performing the uh, exorcism over him, and this was another severe case, and I believe it was in 2018. Um, as the demon was coming out of him, his face, his cheekbones went up like this, and the chin came down like this, so his face became like a V, just like this. And the entity left through the top of his head. Now, when people are possessed, they do not recall what has taken place when these incidents take place. It's, it's as if their mind is unplugged and this external force is plugged in. However... Without me saying anything, this young man told me that all he remembers while this exorcism was taking place is having a tremendous pressure in the top of his head. And that's where the entity left from the top of his head. So again, just imagine, Curry, if you will, for a second, what I'm saying to you, that this, this young man's face his chin came down like this and his cheekbones went up like that, literally changed into like this V and then the entity left the top of his head. Wow. Yeah. I want to get into, because you also cover in the book, uh, things like UFOs. Uh, yeah. you, you, you and I were talking before we started here recording the show. Uh, you've had a lot of experiences yourself. Um, I've been following the topic for well over 20 years somewhat quietly as I was serving in the military. Sure. Uh, you know, you've had these experiences, and I think I heard you in another interview, which I thought was quite interesting. You think there may be possibly three or four explanations for these uh, manifestations, if you will, or, you know, these craft appearing. Uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about what you think could be the possibilities here. Of Well, in my opinion strictly my opinion there are four possibilities and one um if we want to look at it from a bi biblical standpoint uh, psalm 68 17 says the chariots of god are twenty thousand. so i think the origins of these craft are from god himself yahweh elohim the most high god uh, why does he use these craft i don't know you'd have to ask him i have no idea but he created everything so he can do whatever he wants to do but I think that it originates from him and uh, the heavenly host traverse the heavens, which means skies, in flying craft. Now, Satan, uh, the devil who held a very high position in heaven, he was the choir director. He was very, very special and very important. Um, he was privy to this information and this technology in heaven. So I feel that when um, God had him and a third of the angels cast out, they were cast out of heaven in those flying craft, and they came down here, took human women, uh, produced a hybrid offspring of giants called the Nephilim. And I really believe that the uh, that that these demons that that came down, the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, that were cast out and came down, they they operate those craft as well. So the heavenly chariots of God or the Merkaba. The, uh, the demonic uh, chariots of the devil or the Bamana. And um, so then you can factor in also, I'm firmly convinced now, that our military and our governments uh, in many places around the world also have this technology. And I think it started with Nazi Germany, to be honest with you. And I think that uh, we, uh, certainly in America, I feel that through black projects, we have some of these types of craft that the military operates from time to time. And then the uh, fourth factor in this, in my opinion, is that uh, in the vastness of the universe that Yahweh created, then um, I think it would be very small minded of us to think that we're the only species of intelligent life throughout 
the universe. I, I find it laughable. So um, perhaps some of those people or beings or whatever you want to call them uh, have the ability and capabilities to come and uh, study us as well. So there are, in my opinion, four factors that uh, sort of connect in this way. And um, the UFO phenomena is certainly increasing, um, not just in America, but throughout the world. What does that mean? I do not know. However, I have to say that I believe that history repeats itself. I believe that we are in a very bad time as a people, a nation, a society, um, people of the planet Earth. I think that we are, are living through a bad, bad time. And how does it get resolved? I, I have my theories on how it's going to get resolved, but I pray that it doesn't go that way because historically, again, if we look at it from a biblical standpoint, um, if this is sort of a repeat of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is not going to be good for mankind because God is going to have enough and then, boy, look out. Uh, but I do pray that that God will have mercy on us and help us to right the ship to where we can get back uh, to really doing well as a people and loving each other and caring about each other and wanting to do for one another. And if we could uh, get back to that way of thinking and living, suddenly the world becomes a better place overnight. So it just, uh, it all depends. It's free will. We all have free will and we're free to make our choices. But I pray that people, especially our young people now, will take a step back and say, what can I do to be a help and a contributor to society? Now, Bill, uh, I know we're we're a little bit short on time. Uh, would you be okay if we displayed a few of these uh, UFO uh, sightings you've had that you've actually captured pictures of? Kind of. Oh, your... absolutely, sure, Curry. And you right. can take any photos you want from my site, or if you want more, I can send more. Uh, use whatever you want, my brother. All right, we're going to do a share screen. I'll pull up a few of these here. Okay, so there's one here that uh, this is kind of a disc shape. Oh, object. yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was taken in 2001. Now, this, what I'm about to say to you, some people might find this just absolutely off the charts crazy. As I said to you earlier in the year, interview, that God does give me a knowing of things, holy discernment. On this particular day, it was in 2001 in Reisterstown, Maryland. Um, I was sitting in a parking lot. I had a camera, carried a camera with me everywhere I went. And I knew when these things were there. Had an automatic knowing. I picked the camera up, took the shot, and there it was. I've done this with other people. I've been written about in many books. And uh, in some of those books, people have talked about, eyewitnesses talked about, uh, me saying to them, take a picture in the sky there. And they'd say, what, what are you talking about? I don't see anything. It's a blank sky, just like a you know clear sky like that. And I said, there is an object there. You can't see it, but it's there. And they would take photos, and sure enough, it would be there. Uh, one man named Stephen Zekas wrote a book uh, called Synchronistic Adventures. And he wrote about me in the book. Uh, Zekas was with me on this day in July. I think it was 2000. And... Um, it was a hot day and blue sky and we're standing there talking. And I said to him, take a photo there of that section of the sky. He says, there's nothing there, Bill. I said, there's something there. So he takes his camera and I said, I'll, I'll, I had a camera with me as well. I said, let's both take the picture at the same time. Your camera, my camera. So two different cameras. Let's take a picture and let's see what we get. And sure enough, we both took the picture at the same time, captured the same exact disc object that was right there that we could not see with the naked eye, yet I knew it was there. We took the photo with two different cameras and it was there. Now, and so this showed up in both of those images then, taken yeah. from the two different cameras. Oh, not this particular image. It was a different Im image. Uh, it's not, I don't believe it's a photo that you have in this. But I was by myself when I took the photograph of this uh, cylindrical type of object. And that was in Reisterstown, Maryland, 2001. Got another one here. 
a little bit different shaped object. Yep, that was taken in Front Royal, Virginia, 1997. And uh, I often wondered, what did I really see there? Did I see some type of brown looking, I don't even know what you'd call that. You can't call it a disc. Or is that the Mothman? I don't know. I really don't know. But uh, it's very interesting uh, because it was in Front Royal, Virginia, which is not too far away from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where the Mothman is is very prominent there. But um, it's interesting. So whatever it is, it's definitely an unidentified flying object, not a conventional aircraft, and very bizarre. Yeah, there's another one here, and I don't know this if this is just from it streaking or if there's multiple here. On this that one. was uh, that was the very first photograph I took of a UFO, and it was on October fifth, nineteen ninety five, and it looked exactly like that. And for some reason, I had an Olympus OMG thirty five millimeter camera, and for some reason, uh, this craft was over the tree line, and I don't know why it went dark here. It should have shown the trees, but I didn't have a flash on the camera. Maybe that's why uh, it went dark, but that's what it was. It was like this boomerang shaped object and it flew right down the tree line. So uh, uh, my wife was with me. It was like two o'clock in the morning, 2.45 a.m. I think. So it's closer to three and uh, we're traveling north. The object is coming out of the west. It came right across, very similar to what I described to you what, before we started the show. Um, it, it came right across, and it um, it stopped. It stopped in midair over the tree line. I got out of the car. My wife did not want me to stop the car and get out. She was very upset, and uh, <laughs> she was. She was terrified, and I, I got out, and I started taking pictures. I took eight shots. And after the eighth shot, it just zipped right. And it was silent. There was no noise coming from it at all. And it zipped right down the tree line after the eighth shot that I got. It zipped just silently, just right down the tree line. Wow. Now, yeah, if you look at this picture not knowing, it looks like there, there could be more than one here. Yeah, because uh, you see something else out in front of it. And I'm not sure what that was because I saw it just like this, like this boomerang type of thing. But yeah, you're, I mean, these are all kinds of different sightings. I'm going to go to the next one here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was taken in Woodlawn, Maryland, I believe 1996. And look at that thing. I mean, it, it looks like some kind of uh, stingray or manta ray or something. You know, you see it and it's got the, this tail. And you can even see the red. There's like a red part. So you see this illuminated uh, yellow green around it. And then you see the red on the on the tail part. Now, uh, Bill, I got to ask you this. Do you ever get, um, you feel like when you see these things, there's any sort of messages sent to you, anything like that? I can tell you this, Curry. There have been times to where I felt like I was having a divine experience, like it was God's angel surrounding me and protecting me. And then other times I felt like my life was in jeopardy. Yeah, and one of the reasons why I asked that is I don't know if you're familiar with the 1997 Phoenix Lights incident. I am, and and my uh, that previous shot you showed was compared to one of the eyewitness sightings of the Phoenix Lights. Yeah, that that's one. interesting. Yeah, yeah the, the three lights. A lot of people reported during those sightings of feeling kind of a sense of calm. Um, it seems that it, it was almost as if there was some sort of message being sent to like, hey, we're, you know, people just reported feeling calm. They did. They weren't panicking. Uh, people said they had this sense of, well, I already said a sense of calm. I want yeah. to sound repetitive here, but almost as if they were saying we're not here you know we're here for pe peaceful purposes and many many witnesses reported that and that's that's one of the most bizarre but maybe one of the most unusual things i've heard about a mass ufo sighting yeah. like what took place there on the phoenix lights and so. and praise god for that because boy i'll tell you if it were the other way and you suddenly had these things turning up everywhere at once the people would be in a panic 
it would be sheer terror and panic. And, you know, I, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the fourth possibility there, but it just seems like such a complex issue. It um, is. So many layers to it. And now we've got the Navy videos that have been released. Uh, and uh, just just such a complex issue and so hard to try and kind of get your arms around and figure out what the heck's going on with this. There's also another thing you talk about in the book, and that's, and I've covered this on the show before, and that's Mandela Effect. Um, yeah. Interesting things happening that seem to be kind of changing. What's uh, What's been kind of your take on the Mandela effect and what may be going on here? Well, again, in my opinion, I think this is absolutely satanic. And the reason I say that is because the devil is the author of confusion and division. And that's what this thing is doing. And I've had, uh, it, which astounds me, I've had people, pastors, that have come out against me on this and said, you're crazy, nothing ever changed and all that. And I said, oh, really? So you're, you're saying that, uh, that uh, the scripture, it used to say his uh, body is well fed, his bones are moistened with marrow. I think it's Job uh, 24, 21. Um, and, and so you, and that's what the scripture said. His body is well fed, his bones are moistened with marrow. Now it says his breasts are full of milk. His breasts are full of milk. Uh, his bones are moistened with, so, so you're telling me it's always said that, right? And well, if you're telling me that's always said that you never knew your Bible in the first place. And that's exactly, I had a debate with uh, a pastor about it and, and other people, you know, there are many for the most part, Curry that say, wow, thank you so much for pointing this out. And I wasn't the first person to point this out. Somebody actually pointed it out to me before I knew anything. I mean, I'd heard a little bit about it, but I wasn't paying attention to it. And then um, I'd helped this uh, lady from Scotland. And a couple weeks later, she sent me this video uh, asking me to take a look at it. Now, I was annoyed at first because I thought, I'm busy. I don't have time for this craziness, you know. And, and then God stopped me and, and really put it on my spirit to watch. And I did. And uh, I've got all kinds of Bibles in my house. You know, one on my desk here. I've got, a, I don't know, four or five of them that I've got and laid out. And the video was saying that Isaiah eleven six, 6, which is one of the most popular scriptures ever. That's in the, the one I was thinking of. Yes. Yeah, the lion laying down with the lamb. There are yes. statues of it. I mean, there. look, see that? There's statues, there's, there's paintings, um, you name it, based on that scripture. So in the video, uh, the man says... Uh, it was saying that uh, the scripture had been changed and it now says the wolf. I said, no, no, come on. Uh, I, it's this preposterous. I got all my Bibles. I laid them out on my desk, turned them on. Oh, one of my Bibles is um, nearly 160 years old. I laid them all out and I turned to Isaiah 11, 6. And I felt like I was going to fall out of my chair. Mm -hmm. When I saw... Those scriptures changed in my Bibles, in my possession. I didn't have an answer for that. And that almost threw me out of my chair because I know the scriptures. I spent years in serious biblical studies. And when I saw that, that confounded me to the point to where I, it took me a couple of weeks to truly be able to try and fathom it that it really changed and then there's a plethora of other scriptures as well uh that continue to change and not just scriptures i mean there are everyday things uh that are changing also yeah and it kind of plays into for a lot of people this uh idea of a multiverse um universe kind of concept there's a lot of other examples, and uh, some some people have just simply chalked it up to false memory. Yeah, uh, confabulation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's right. a nice term for it, confabulation. But we're all just having this false memory? I mean, uh, it's it's kind Sorry. of hard to, to believe that that would be the case when so many people remember things differently. You I'm going to give just... you a quick example right here, Curry. Uh, I don't want to get too far in because I know we're running out of time, but... Um, this is one of the more recent changes that I have found. Uh, <laughs> you tell me. 
the scripture now says this is uh revelation 19 16 okay it is describing jesus as having a tattoo on his thigh and uh his robe now has writing on it saying king of kings and lord of lords so now in revelation 19 16 jesus has a tattoo on his thigh and he has a name written on his robe and his thigh king of kings and lord of lords you ever heard of that one wow i haven't but i'm gonna <laughs> look it up i'm gonna look that up now and also this is something that's been around for a while and people really don't talk about it and i'll tell you i i understand why they don't want to talk about it um it just disturbs me like you wouldn't believe to know that this i'm trying to find the image of it right now i'll have to send this to you um this is in the sistine chapel um and you know where all the paintings are up there there's now an image of god yahweh the creator of the universe and there are two images one is from the front that shows him with the cherubs and the second i don't know if i can do this or not see that yes it is showing the rear end of god now wow this is total blasphemy this is uh i'd never heard of anything like that before and yet there it is um just wicked garbage and this is why i say it's evil this is a mock of god it's wickedness um there are also scriptures now uh with god saying ho ho uh like santa claus there's another scripture um isaiah 7 18 where it says it shall come to pass in that day that the lord shall whistle it was whistle for the fly that is in the uttermost now it says the lord shall hiss for the fly it's, it's just bizarre it is so bizarre it's this. completely bizarre and you know i could go down and i know we don't have time but i mean there there are <laughs> just you just have to see it to believe it. And i do have it in the new book uh it's there you can verify it i mean it, it's not just scripture changes it is everyday life type of changes and titles um, yeah the, the, the i always remember the monopoly man with the monocle and me uh, too yeah <laughs> i always you know, Forrest Gump, like that. Mama said, life is like a box of chocolates, and yes. now it says life was like a box of chocolates. Um, the the uh, field of dreams, where it used to say, if you build it, they will come. Now it says, if you build it, he will come. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, the big promo line there, hello, Clarice, is not there anymore, and they say that it's never been there. Um, this is absolutely bizarre. Yeah, the other one that got thrown at me uh, when I had uh, Rob uh, Shelsky on the show, he wrote the book Mandela Effect Shattered Reality, was uh, the color chartreuse. And I've asked this yeah. to a lot of people who seem to remember that color being some sort of violet type color. And uh, now you look up chartreuse and it's uh, like in like a green. green of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's another bizarre one. Yeah, it really. just goes on and on. I mean, it, it's just you look at this and you go, what? Even like the DEA. DEA stood for Drug Enforcement Agency. As long as and I agents. can remember. And now it's Drug Enforcement Administration, and they say that it's always been Drug Enforcement Administration. Interesting. Grand Central Station. Everybody knows Grand Central Station. It's busier than Grand Central Station around here. Now they say it's Grand Central Terminal, and it's always been Grand Central Terminal. Wow. Doesn't sound right to me. Yeah, me neither. I, I hadn't heard that one before, but uh, it does baffle the mind. It's, uh, it's uh, bizarre stuff. Well, Bill, um, it's been quite a fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm glad we got to, to delve into a few of these other topics as well that you cover in the book. I'm going to throw up, I'll do the share screen again to throw up a picture of the book. Thank you so much, Curry. It's been great being on with you, and I hope to come back again sometime and certainly give you an update. Uh, and also, I 
probably going to start working on another book here soon uh, about some of the uh, mysterious places around the world. So it'll probably be the next project. But uh, I'm really proud of this book, getting great reviews. I want to thank everybody out there if you have purchased a copy. And if you haven't, you can visit uh, www.billjbean.com if you want a, a, a personalized uh, signed copy from me. Um, or you can get it on Amazon. And uh, same thing, if you're out there and you're in spiritual need and you are having some of these problems that we've discussed, please don't hesitate to contact me, uh, www.billjbean.com. You can email me directly from the site and uh, we will get back to you as quickly as possible. All right, Bill. Uh, once again, thank you for spending the time with me, talking with me. It's a great uh, discussion, fascinating stuff. Uh, have a great rest of your night and uh, best of luck to you and all your future work. Thank you so much, Curry. I appreciate it and definitely look forward to talking with you again sometime. And I want to thank everybody out there for tuning in. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Bill. there.